structure the, uh, the brain in such a way as to be ready to perform cognitive tests. I think there's a lot of possibility, and I'll say a little bit more about it very briefly, but I, but I do so in the context of now trying to talk about what kind of philosophy of science picture that's beginning, that I think is appropriate for thinking about endogenous reactive systems as the brain, I think, is turning out to be. And not surprisingly, I'm pushing the view that it's a dynamic, mechanistic perspective. Um, let me, uh, I've uh, uh, primped from, from Kant uh, the idea that uh, 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 dynamics without mechanism may be empty. You'll know where the other half is going to be in just a second. Uh, but uh, uh, my worry about many of dynamics accounts that have eschewed uh, mechanistic research is that uh, they cut themselves off from the potential to figure to actually link the equations that are used in characterizing the dynamical system to actual changes in variables that correspond to parts and operations of the mechanism itself. And increasingly, uh, one, uh, one area that this is, I think, increasingly important is as we start to understand the mode of organization of systems. In the 20th century, much of our thinking about the way systems was organized focused on these three modes of organization here. Either regular lattices, uh, mean field uh, networks, that is every unit connected to everything else so that you could figure out the input, uh, influence on this unit of the others by taking the uh, mean of the activity of the others, or randomly organized networks. These networks, all these designs were pursued in part because they were mathematically tractable. They seemed like the plausible kinds of things to work with. Uh, in the 1990s, Steve Strogatz, uh, Duncan Watts, and a variety of others have started to focus on what are called small world networks. A small world network is characterized by having a high clustering of units as one finds in a regular lab, so that uh, units tend to be highly connected to their, to their near neighbors, but to still have a few long distance connections to other parts of the network, so it's not a, a, a totally a lattice structure. If you think about a lattice structure, it has the virtue of allowing for high coordination between local units. They could become, say, specialized processing units, but very low, uh, very slow time to get messages across a whole network. A, a totally interconnected network or a random network actually allows for very quick transmission across the whole network, but very little clustering of, of more specialized components. In the small world network, one actually gets both advantages at once. High clustering allowing for coordinated uh, groups of units to coordinate their activities, specialize on a task, but it's not modules in the philosophical sense of a module, an isolated component, because there is rapid communication coordination across the whole network. Uh, we are now finding good evidence, of, actually I'll come back to that, uh, uh, that the brain is organized that way. Well, let me try, uh, focus on the other side of the equation for a moment. Mechanism without dynamics is blind. Uh, to understand how a mechanism is going to behave, we not only need to be able to characterize what the parts do, but how they will all work together in real time. For the most part, we are terrible at doing this in our heads, uh, especially when the interactions start to become mathematically nonlinear, the, the organization is non-sequential, especially when we're dealing with, as we always are, um, uh, energetically open systems. Um, now, it's going to tie right back to the theme of small worlds, is as one starts to understand the dynamics of networks, one can understand how the dynamics of networks can change over, uh, over time. Um, and the kind of activity within the network can lead to it forming a particular kind of architecture. In fact, there's a, a strategy here that I'm going to briefly talk about of how to evolve a small world organization that draws upon some work uh, Case on Lumen has done um, uh, with Ho and Gong, uh, where what they are doing is taking a, a neural network, but unlike the neural networks that most of us are familiar with in, in say, connectionist AI, where networks sum their activity and pass on a signal, uh, these are dynamically active individual components. Uh, to, do, to achieve that, he takes a uh, logistic function as the key to his model, his, his uh, count of the activity of individual units, 
Uh, with that, uh, what, he's what that's going to do is give you uh, units that continually oscillate uh, depending on the value of A. Um, but what he's doing now is coupling them, so we're going to have the, the value of a particular unit depend upon uh, both uh, uh, its previous activation given this kind of function uh, and inputs from, from other units. And what all I want to draw out of this is what he, what he does about, uh, to update the network. If you set a network working with this kind of, of an of a, uh, uh, activation rule, what you will find is, setting the parameters at, at appropriate values, is a network where different units will oscillate in synchrony with each other temporarily and then dissociate their activity uh, from each other. What he does then is then replaces connections that, are, that happened already be in place between relatively unsynchronized units with those between the units that are most synchronized. And what pops out of this is that one begins to get a small world architecture. One gets a clustering that, that more reflects a, a, uh, a lattice structure that is uh, a high degree of specialization within constituents, but also a relatively short communication path across the whole network. That is, one gets a small world architecture. Could you, could you elaborate just slightly on that update? Like the replace coupling between least synchronized units with one. I, okay. For some reason, I'm just not getting that. Okay. You've got a network, things are spontaneously oscillating. Stop it at this moment, find and take this unit, see who it's connected to, and if one of, it, of the units it's connected to uh, it's really out of phase with, mm -hmm. break that connection, find any other unit in the network with which it's uh, um, uh, well coupled, or well it's synchronized in its oscillation, mm -hmm. put in a connection. Right. And what happens over time is that you get this kind of small Thanks. world structure out of it. Um, Um, let me just finish this off by saying what are some of the consequences for thinking about philosophy of science once one starts thinking about these kind of dynamically active systems with complex networks and so on. One is, I noted at the beginning the power of visualization tools. I actually uh, used using here some very old work of, uh, in, in, in population genetics by Sewell Wright who realized much the same problem. If you're going to understand the behavior of these kinds of complex networks, one needs a way of visualizing the behavior. Uh, uh, so one's going to need to draw upon the kinds of representational tools that dynamical systems have given us here on uh, an adaptive landscape uh, to understand how such a system will behave over time. We can't rely on, on, on intuitions. Uh, but need to do both mathematical modeling, but also the uh, graphical representation to even begin to understand what kind of, of behavior we're getting out of such a system. Uh, 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 one reason this is particularly important is, not, is that, uh, as Wright and Paul Pat knew in his work on adaptive landscapes, changes of components within the system will alter the landscape itself. Uh, so we're going to not just have one pattern of trajectories through a landscape, <coughs> but a continuously altering landscape, which gives rise to uh, uh, changing trajectories through the landscape. Uh, second point I really want to emphasize is uh, the idea that I touched on at the beginning, <coughs> that from a mechanistic perspective already, there's a need to look both down into the mechanism to figure out its constituents, and up to the organization and out to the world to understand how it's situated. When, when uh, one starts to deal with these complex dynamical systems, this becomes even more true. And I think of a uh, kind of line that Bill Wimsett articulated long ago, that one could be, needs to be, in fact, a reductionist and an emergentist, too. Uh, when it's not enough to look in just one of these directions. If you want a dynamics account that actually fits the, the uh, underlying mechanism, one has to engage in the classical kinds of projects of decomposing a mechanism to understand its parts and operations, uh, but one also needs to couple that and, and, and actually di uh, dialectically couple it with a focus on the emerging properties of, of, of uh, such a system that will come out by understanding, using mathematical models for instance, how the, how the system is going to behave in real time. Uh, and this is and that's particularly true when we're dealing with 
mechanisms that are non-sequential, interactions that are non-linear, and we're dealing with systems.